Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Session Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the Session 1 Reminders and Homework Review presentation, Jesus works through reminders from the previous Analyze My Desire to Love and Change session and reviews the homework of the participants. Recorded on the 8th of March, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. How are we this morning? You were, you were kept as a prison yesterday, in the prison where you yesterday, or you did, did get out there, or what did you do? A little bit, but it's raining a fair portion of the day. Now it's a lovely sunny day, you wish we swapped the days over. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, today is basically going to be the most difficult day. For you and so I thought I'd warn you about that in advance <laughs> the reason why it's going to be the most difficult day is a number of reasons we're doing we're actually doing three subjects three separate subjects all in the course of the one day and and we don't do that generally on any other day uh, for the whole court for this particular course so so besides the review that we do this morning, we've basically got three subjects to cover and we only have one Q&A session really, that's a, well, an hour long Q&A amongst all of that. So you're going to probably struggle a little to be involved. And, and the other thing that the first group found was that because this, was conf this is the day where you're confronting most of your resistances, most of the first group got fairly resistive through the process, <laughs> unfortunately. So I'd like to encourage you today to stay open and to sort of look at today as a, as a day of being able to experiment a bit with how you feel about yourself emotionally and, and why you find it difficult to have faith, to love truth and take action, which are the three primary things we'll be covering today. But before we get into that, what we're going to do is our revision and homework for the last couple of days just to remind us where we're up to so that we can take, you know, grab today from that particular point. So if we cast our mind back to the very first morning, uh, the subject matter that we discussed right at the beginning was, can you remember? If we just have the mic, so, so yep, if Cardi, thanks. The source. Right, so we, 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 we basically focused on the source of our education. So, so the discussion was, how do we gain an education in love? We firstly have to connect to a source that's higher than ourselves. The, high, the source of the education needs to be higher than our own education already, uh, already existing. And we discussed, remember, the principle that if we engaged the world's education, which most of us have done, haven't we, to different things. And, and the reality is, when we go to do a university course or something like that, we're really being taught by other people who have already learnt those particular subjects, aren't we? And, and the problem with that, of course, is that it, it's limiting to a degree, because unless those particular people teach you to go beyond the knowledge that they're sharing with you, then, then you may feel you know everything about the subject when you know barely anything about the subject. As you learn, as you leave university or leave school, you, you go and investigate a lot of things in your life and then you realise, well, that was only just the beginning of my learning, really. And the same applies, of course, to our education in love. The other main point of that particular discussion was... Can you remember, Megan, down the front here? <coughs> The world's view of love? Yes, yeah, so we, we compared the world's definition of love and we've, it's not equal to God's. And in fact, we learnt one basic thing, didn't we? That actually 
the world's view of love is really, from God's perspective, sin. sin. Yeah. Now, it's a major problem, isn't it? Because we've imbibed the world's view of love, so then what we think is love often is also sin as a result of that imbibing the world's definition of love. So, you know, the things that, that the world expects God to do, God does not do. And the things that, that the world thinks God should not do, God does. So that's a good indication that the definitions of love are completely different. Yeah. So we've imbibed this uh, world's part of uh, definition of love and the problem is, is that it's entered us emotionally. It's entered us in our soul. It's, it's now present within us as a part of us. And that is where our problems begin. That's why it's so hard to get rid of it. Because it's now become a part of us through the, through the process of our childhood and our experiences. And also, very much so, our choices. The choices that we've made. So it's not just, it's not just our childhood and those experiences, but it's the choices we subsequently made which also damage our viewpoint of love as well. Okay, and then our second discussion, which was on the same morning, was about... Cardi, if we... Uh, how I feel about love. So here, what are we trying to do? We're trying to analyse how we feel about love and change, aren't we? We're beginning this process of analysis. And remember I said to you that process may take you months or even years to actually work through these emotions of how you really feel about, about love. So what did we, we, we compared primarily two things there. We asked ourselves how I feel about love and how I feel about God, didn't we? And what did we learn in that process? Can you remember? Sorry, don't you let out if we put up hands, thanks. <laughs> um, Monique? Uh, we <coughs> oh, we learnt that everything that... Um, well, God was like our parent. We see God as our parent, so mm. everything that I want from God... Oh, everything. Oh, sorry. Well, that's true. Everything you want from God you, is, is what you wanted from your parents. Yes. Yep. Yep. And, and I, so I, yeah, I can't have a relationship with God, the real God, because I think God is like my parent. Yep. And change, well, we're terrified of change yep. and think that change is bad yep. and don't have any desire or passion for it. Yes. So it's like in a, we're in a really... It's a difficult place, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, like, a shitty place. Yeah, it's a difficult place. So how we feel about love and change, so I'll just write the change on the end of there as well. Uh, is quite, you know, we found it was quite negative really, wasn't it? Quite negative. And how we feel about change is mostly terrified. And how we feel about love is pretty much mostly terrified too, <laughs> really. And, and we... We impose that on the rest of our life, which is the reason why we have usually relationships that begin quite well, but then end up quite bad. It's also a reason why our life has a lot of problems, sicknesses, disease. We finish up dying of old age uh, for no real reason. Scientists still haven't found the real reason aside from the death, the, the death gene being kicked off inside of our genetic structure at a certain point. And they don't really understand why that activates at that point either so you know there's a whole there's a whole heap of scientific evidence in fact that that something else must be going on that causes us to even die let alone to have diseases and other problems so this is how we feel now now remember i said to you that we need to really be honest about how we feel remember the feedback that i gave you as a group what was that about can you remember the feedback um, if we get David, yes. That we don't really want to take responsibility. Correct, that we don't want to take responsibility to be loving, but what do we want a lot of the times? If we go straight behind you, Dave. <coughs> um, we actually want to do to sin. Yeah, we, we actually... Desire to. Yeah, and, and part of it is because we believe 
what we think is love is sin so that's part of our reason why we want to sin but another part of it is because we don't want to change we don't we feel we've got a certain degree of comfort a certain degree of uh, you know we've gotten rid of a lot of the risks in our life through uh, the choices that we've made and we don't really want to make change because we're terrified of change as well so so yeah there's big problems there for us isn't there in terms of facing that now remember i recommended to you that we have to first settle with that concept inside of us that wow a lot of times i actually want to sin a lot of the times i actually want to do something that's out of harmony with love and truth and and to feel why why you want to is a key part of that feel why yeah and then the, the next morning we focused on this other discussion remember what that was and it's more to do with that same subject wasn't it how and why I remain unloving was the subject. And really that talk was probably the key talk of, the, of, that, of those two, two days. That subject's the key subject. Because there we focused in on the four aspects of, can you remember what they were? Yell them out for me please. Faith, Faith truth, truth Yep, action and emotion, yep. And what did we find about those four particular things? In the end, Ivana, so if we come down front there. Um, that we lie, um, minimise, justify... Um, all those things. All those things. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so let's start with denial, which is a, which is, which is one of the most powerful tools we use. And then, of course, we do lie. But most of us, most of us don't. So to go for lies as much. So what we do is we do the rest of the things, don't we? Which is excuse, justify, blame, and minimise. Yeah. So we do that, and the problem with doing that with each one of these four things that are going to help us change our life is that we are now consigned to never changing, basically, or only changing in a negative direction. Glenda, thanks. Aren't all those things basically the same as lying to ourselves? Yeah, they are. They're methods. But they're what, I'd, they're what I'd classify as slippery methods. <laughs> And that's what I find most people are pretty slippery when it comes to, you know, owning up to the truth about a matter. And pretty slippery in the sense of what we do to ourselves to even avoid the truth in ourselves. So we do all of this because of one real reason, and that is because I want to do it. <laughs> in other words, I'm using my will to deny, lie, excuse, justify, shift, blame and uh, minimise these, these facts. If, if I embraced these particular things, growth would be automatic. That's the reality. Growth would actually be automatic. If I could embrace these things, growth would happen seamlessly. It would happen automatically. Just like I uh, usually began, and a lot of us embraced these things again as a child, didn't we? Like, so most of us felt emotion when something went wrong as a child, and we also felt emotion when something was great as a child, didn't we? we like, so you often see a child going, yeah, 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 but how often do you see an adult doing that, aside from it, at a sporting event or something like that? You know, this is why grown men cry at sporting events. It's the only opportunity they're allowed to have to cry, right? And, and this is the thing, we, we have, as an adult, a st very strict guidelines placed upon our emotion. So which is one reason why we don't feel much of emotion. With regard to action, again, as a child, a child is generally given a, a fair degree of freedom in the way that it acts, isn't it? But as adults, you notice we get rid of that freedom. And then when it comes to truth, as a child, a, a child is very open to truth. Unfortunately, they're also open to lies. 
uh, because they're basically like an open sponge so you can tell them truth or tell them lies but but the reality is that they are open to truth once they and once they know it they put it into practice straight away pretty much once they uh, once they understand it and a child automatically has some faith it looks around at its adults and says well they're doing all these things there's no reason why i can't and and so they embrace a whole heap of actions that cause them to do finish up doing the things that the adults have done so so they have some level of faith and even you today have some level of faith but mostly it's in the physical isn't it in the physical laws so so these particular things were present as a child but as an adult we've 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 created a great big barriers around every one of these things right and this is our primary primary issue and we create the barriers primarily because we don't want to feel certain things that's why we create the barriers so we really want to deny lie excuse justify shift the blame and minimize that's our choice and we need to start seeing it as a choice now many of you have continued to blame you know your childhoods or or life generally or the world for your choices but a responsible adult doesn't do that a responsible adult chooses to accept responsibility for the choices it makes and this is where we need to see that the use of our will is critical in the way in which we will engage any progress and without the use of our will progress is not going to really be possible okay we had some so we had some feedback about that as well in terms of the group feedback about what's going on and we also had some feedback in the group about feeling the i want to sin like feeling that you want it feeling that you want to do something that's out of harmony with love rather than denying that you want to and then wondering why anything's going wrong right we need to start with allowing ourselves to process the feelings that are out of harmony with love without judgment and without acting upon them the majority of us judge them and then we also act upon them right so that's a big issue okay so that was our primary discussion for the first two days and the general thing that we wanted to do was analyze ourselves honestly and without judgment about how we are currently using our will now in in the 2014 assistance groups if you add a, add some of the other discussions on that first day to this you would see that we can measure how we've been going with this over the last two years right we could you compare if you're at that group and you're at this group and you go okay what actually inside of myself has actually changed in that time and if it's very little then we know that there hasn't been a strongly developed will to change all right so that indicates that there's very little will to change but only you have control over that many of you want someone to motivate you to change or god to come along and wave a magic wand of some kind you know <laughs> abracadabra and presto change and and those kind of things and and these things are not going to happen it's completely under your personal control now i like that it's under your personal control because that means it's not dependent upon any external factors which is fantastic but for the majority of us we don't like it's under our personal control we want others to motivate us to pep us up give us pep talks and encouragement and we want others to m motivate the change we even want others to be responsible when we make mistakes about our own progression and, and in our own change so so that's an indication we don't want to take responsibility for our own use of our will so what we're trying to do is see, help you see that the how you use your will is critical in your future progression all right right so that being the case we come to your homework and if i can just list some of the areas of your homework if we just go through them one by one just rub this off so if you can find your homework if you brought that along with you
Okay, I'll just uh, find it myself. So the question, first question was, how do I personally feel about love? Now, I'm not going to ask you for how you personally feel about love. What I'm going to ask you to tell me is, what did you learn in that process? What, what was this? Not, not the individual things that you, learn, that you feel about love, but rather as a global, as, as sort of a summary, what did you learn in that process? So go right up the back to Jennifer. I learned that um, I really didn't know about love and I didn't know how to feel real love and that I'm very angry and I can be very abusive. Yeah. Okay, so that's they are good, honest things that we can sense. Then, yeah, if we go straight across, if we come I felt down to I was very self-centered and egotistical, and wanting people just to love me. And if they didn't, I have a lot of hate for what's around me. But it does fluctuate. Yeah. So, so there's almost a um, most of us almost have a narcissistic view of life even like we're self-centered and everything's got to sort of revolve around us doesn't it a lot of the times and this is something that we need to come to terms with in terms of sorting out our life in that regard so marie if we come down to marie and then across to natalie uh, i learned that i refuse to love but i demand it and then i won't receive it yeah, isn't that strange? It's like you refuse to do it, but then you demand it, and then you won't receive it. It's all very confusing to the person who's trying to do it then, isn't it, obviously? If we go Pamela next. So Natalie, thanks. Uh, I learnt that I don't trust love, therefore I can't give any. Um, like, I learnt that I'm just completely incapable of loving someone. Yeah. But also there's a uh, – because I don't trust that I don't want anyone to love me either. Are you incapable? Is no, that true? No, no. <laughs> but that's what the feeling is inside of me, that I, I'm not willing... Uh, no, I'm not incapable. I'm not willing to love anyone. Yeah, but just be very careful about your choices of the words. Uh, and in fact, uh, one th great thing about your choice of words is it does display quite some set beliefs, actually. So, so rather than trying to correct the choice of the word, the word that you used was, I'm incapable, then can, you can see that that must be a belief you have. That, that you're really incapable of loving and and so and that that is a false belief so you're not going to be able to process that particular belief are you somehow you have to find the truth of why you feel like you're incapable of loving does that make sense yeah. so yeah, but but it is important to see how we use our words because how we use our words is often a reflection of what's really going on inside of us yeah. okay. Pamela thanks I felt the absence of it in your life, yes. Generally, yes. Yep. In terms of giving or and receiving, or 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 all of it, all of it. yeah, all of it. yeah. So so most of us set up a very alone life, haven't we? Yes. You can see that the majority in the audience, have, you've set up an alone life. It's sort of a similar to that to the Glenn character. Oh, it was Glenn, Greg, Glenn. Glenn character in the channeling, wasn't it? Um, you know, you set up an alone life, thinking that this was life, sort of thing, thinking it was okay, but. But because of hurts that he's had in the past, he's, and most of us live alone. And even those of us who are in relationships live alone. <laughs> Frequently, yeah. yeah. If we go to David down the front and across to Christiana on this side. I've wanted to be massively rebellious against the world's definition of love as well as... So any time that sort of love or someone wanting to project that they're loving me, yeah, I've just been massively rebellious against that and wanted to do the opposite. Right. Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so this feeling of rebellion obviously comes from an anger inside, doesn't it? Yeah, about, massively. About love. You know, that I, I was mum's good boy and <laughs> I just didn't want to be that anymore. Yeah, basically. yeah. When your parents suck you dry... <laughs> <laughs> which is often what parents do you know a lot of parents have children in order to ha ha uh, to for the children to give the parents something mm. that's the main reason why a lot of parents have children and in fact uh, you know a lot of parents feel that they have to keep having children in order to get this validation and also ladies a lot of women have been taught right from their their childhood and, and it's a multi-generational problem and that is that you're not a woman until you have a child so there's already an investment of worth in having a child as well so that that makes it very different difficult for the children 
uh, of which you've been one of a woman like that so you know that makes it very difficult in terms of in terms of growing and taking responsibility and seeing that actually that kind of love love is not love at all and that takes a lot of change to occur to, to get to that point of belief yeah yeah um christiana that love is has to be all on my terms it has to be delivered in the particular way that i deem love to be so i can receive it or give it or whatever yes yeah, that's a big issue that you do face and I feel a lot of people face. Um, how many of you feel, if you listen to that statement, that, yeah, you can see that it has to all be on your terms? Yes. Yeah, it can't be, you know, something else other than what you've previously defined. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a big issue, isn't it, that issue? Because, because when you think about the issue itself, it means that basically you're saying that there's no other l such thing as love other than what you've already defined it to be. Yeah. And, and, and like I said at the beginning of our discussion on, on Saturday, there's seven billion different definitions <laughs> of what that is, which is the reason why we're so confused. <laughs> there's not just one definition of what love is, there's like billions and billions. <laughs> Every one of us has an individual definition of what love actually is, yeah. Um, if we go up the back to Maxine, on that side, and on this side, who has your hand up? If you just put your hand up. If we come down to Carol on this side. If you leave your hand up, Carol. Yep. So, Maxine? <laughs> um, I find it's, it's too hard. It's sexual bartering. It's conditioning. It's dramatic. Um, it uh, falls out of love. I want to run away from it. It hurts. It's confusing. It's jealousy. It's, it's through showing through um, toxic ways. Yep. Yeah. So, if you summarise all of that, what's your, what's your outlook? Um, I avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. So, so can we see for most of us, this is a reason why even when it comes to our relationship with God, we feel alone. And when it comes to our relationship with other people, we often feel alone as well. Yep. So we're sort of working through life just really feeling alone. And frankly, a lot of our friends actually have exactly the same attitude that we have. So that actually helps us maintain the attitude. The law of attraction works perfectly, so that means that many people with the same attitudes gather together and they all then perpetrate these same attitudes on each other. So, so this is why, you know, you ladies, guys and girls that have this attitude of what's the point of having a relationship, they all gather together. The guys generally do it at the pub and the girls generally do it down the coffee, down having a coffee or whatever, you know. You, you, you have all these attitudes that develop as a result of the feelings. Yeah. We were over, Carol. Mm. I realised that I felt like I'm not allowed to love mm -hmm. because um, it will turn out, terrible things will happen, not just to me but to the people around me Right. because my desires are bad. Right, so, yeah, so there's obviously attitudes there that need to be worked on. Now, can you see... We, we won't go further into that discussion, but can you see already that we've, uh, we're identifying easily enough how we feel about it? So identifying how we feel about it is not really our problem, is it? It's feeling those feelings and letting them go. That's our real problem. Can you see that? Because uh, identifying the feelings is relatively easy to do. It's feeling the feelings that we've not been doing. We, we've been living in them. We've been carrying them on as if they're true, as if they're reality. Right? We, we want to believe they are real when they are just false beliefs. And this is what we need to work on. Now, with regard to our second question, we, we asked us, how do we personally feel about God? So what did you learn in that analysis? If we come to Sandra on this side, Talia on this side. Um, I had a huge realisation about, you know, how you said that there can, is... Uh, can these guys see you? Yes, both. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks. I just realised, you know, that whole thing you said about how we view parents, we view God as our parent, with the same feelings that we have towards parents. And I realised that the denial of actually acknowledging how we truly feel about our parents is what we project about towards God and it's the denial itself. Mm. So when I actually confronted some of the feelings about 
what has truly happened, the mm. truth of what had happened. Yeah. I realized God is a tyrant. And that's that, that same thing you've described. I realized for the first time, I actually feel that way about God. Yeah. And about you as well, because of the messenger mm. being of God. So yeah. It's yeah. pretty full on. Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah, most people project that at me as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's very rare, in fact, to not receive that projection from people. So there's an indication that, that at once, so when somebody has a view of love that's out of harmony with our own view of love, we then believe that they are wrong and bad. Don't me as well. Yeah. If we go straight back to David there, who we were on this side. Tali, thanks. Um, just in comparing God to my father and how I feel about him, yeah. um, I wrote, I'm angry at my father for always breaking his promises to me. He's a cunt, completely unreliable. Yeah. He's never been there for me and I do hate him. He never provided for me or took care of me and that's how I feel about you, God. Yeah. You're so rich and abundant but yet you do not take care of my basic needs. I do not trust in you that I can fully 100% trust you with my life. I feel like I have to do it all by myself, that the only reliable person in my life is me. And that's, yeah. that's true feelings. Yeah, no, and, and, and Tali, that, writing it like that is very powerful because it's like a letter to God, isn't it? Like, this is how I really feel about God. But, but, but one thing you need to remember, though, is that's really how you feel about Dad, not yeah, God. Absolutely, yeah. Right? So the only way you're really going to be able to process the emotion is to allow yourself to feel those things about Dad. Right? And this is where I see we get really mixed up with God because we think we have all these feelings towards God, but actually, you know, like we discussed, uh, really only towards our family of origin generally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've only just started, um, you know, saying to God in the last couple of days since being here that I want to begin to disassociate you with my father. So, yeah. yeah. So this, this is a great thing to remember, isn't it? Remember we did discuss that, how how what we what we view God to be is usually what we feel our parents were. Right. Um, just, uh, and, and what we need to do is separate that emotionally from ourselves. Now, obviously, we could choose to make that separation fairly quickly, couldn't we? Even though we might have a whole heap of emotion here on this side, towards our parents, we could choose to make this disconnection between our parents and God, couldn't we? Because we don't have to actually feel much to do that. We only have to make the separation inside of ourselves somehow, and we'll talk a little bit about how. But can you see that for the majority of us, we don't want to do that? And we don't want to do that because we've got all this emotion with our parents that really hurt, and we don't want to have to feel it. And we want our parents to have to do it, deal, deal with it. Or we want God to make it all go away. Right? Rather than just choosing to feel it. And this is our big problem is that when we choose to not feel it, we now are searching for things to associate it with and blame those particular things. We, blame, we finish up blaming our partner for things they've never done. We finish up blaming God for things God has never done. We finish up blaming the people we love for things that they've never done. This is what we do. Just so that we can avoid feeling who actually did these things to us and what they did do. Uh, so so it's, very, it's, a, it's a choice we're making. It's very important to see that choice. Yep. Good day. Um, if we go Graham and Joyce. Oh, sorry, Dave's next. Sorry, Dave next, so... Fire away, Dave. Yeah, basically, uh, God's <coughs> harsh, punishing, unloving, uncaring about me. But interestingly, I find that occasionally during my life when I feel things are going well, I'm extremely grateful to God, and I say so. Yeah, see, I would, I, I would say to you that's only because you think God's now rewarding you, which is a, which is a part of the same problem. Does that make sense? The, the view that God's punishing you when things are going bad and God's rewarding you when things are going good is the part of exactly the same problem. God does neither. <laughs> you know, God doesn't reward you for things going good. All of God's laws, you're now working in harmony with all of God's laws. Of course things are going to go good. <laughs> you know, when, you, when things go bad, well, you're working out of harmony with all of God, uh, some of God's laws. Well, of course things are going to go bad. 
There's no, there's no, it's not like an arbitrary decision that God is making either way. I think sometimes too when some of my addictions are being met, I'm feeling grateful for that. Yeah, I, I feel the majority of people feel that, yeah. Feed my addictions in my facade and I'll, I'll think you're a lovely person. <laughs> of course, God doesn't do that. So, Hence our viewpoint of anger towards God. We often feel angry with God because God's not feeding my addictions. God's not feeding my facade. God's confronting it and God's laws are confronting it. So this is why we want to ignore the majority of God's laws as well. We can ignore the laws. We ignore the relationship between the cause and the effect if we can ignore the law. So sort of like, it's a, in a physical way, it's like, like jumping off a building and expecting to not break your legs when you've jumped off a, <laughs> off a building, you know. It's like, it's a crazy thought physically, but that's what we do emotionally constantly. We, we, we do the equivalent of jumping off of buildings, hoping that we're not going to get hurt. Right? And then when we do get hurt, we get all angry with the fact that we've got hurt, when, the, when it's quite obvious to the law. We come down to Joyce next. Yeah, um, when I was with the New Age path, yep. I found it very, well, I, th I felt that it was quite easy to tap into God as a universal power. But since I've real, you've said there is an entity mm -hmm. and he actually wants a personal relationship with me, I found that really, really difficult to, to comprehend. Yeah, I suggest actually that you weren't tapping into God. No. You were tapping into spirits who believed themselves to be God. So mo most people on the New Age path who believe they're tapping into God are not tapping into God at all because they don't even have the correct belief about God. They are tapping in to spirits who feed them a lot of addictive emotions. And this is why the New Age path has a lot of addictive followers because a lot of the addictions are getting met through following the path. Right? And, and following God's way is never going to be like that. It's a very narrow way in that regard. Um, it requires that you now want to give up your addictions that are out of harmony with love, whereas the New Age path generally allows you to feed the addictions that are out of harmony with love in order to feel what they feel is a semblance of happiness. So, yeah, it's very, very different. And, and many of us come from these paths, right, in, in our life when we discover God's truth. So we, impl we impose our beliefs of those paths upon God's truth too. So we even think that that's what God's doing. And when we feel a nice feeling, we think it's from God now. When we, we haven't changed in our heart thinking that actually, no, God's just an energy. The reality is God is a per personality, has, has individuality. He's the great oversoul of the universe. And, and as such, we can get to know him. And once, once we start looking at it like that, you can see the majority of us like fade, fade away from that. We, we, we try to run away, in fact, from that. Because generally, we don't want anybody to really know us because we suspect that deep down there's something wrong with us anyway. And also, when it comes to God, we have a lot of beliefs about it being impossible to know God. Yeah. Okay, so Graham, if we go across Graham, come down to Claudia straight from Graham. And on this side, yeah, yeah, sorry, we're still, let's go to Graham, Graham first. Uh, Graham, sorry, Graham's, um, my other Graham was, was in front of you. <laughs> go ahead. I sincerely believe in God, mm -hmm. but I don't feel I actually need to form a relationship with God. Yeah, isn't that strange? I can just do it myself. Yeah. And it's okay to get all the information and I, to, to, for me to build, sincerely believe that God exists and, and that's enough that I don't actually need to... So there's no this. desire for a personal relationship? Yeah. 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 And this, uh, I, I've met many millions of people in the same place and, and there's always some underlying fears underneath that particular belief system. Yeah. What do you reckon they might be? Well, if I analyse it, I guess I'm thinking of uh, that I'm bad, that when I'm bad I get punished. My father used to punish me, so perhaps... Yeah, for yourself, Graham, I feel a lot of it's about how you view love is about, is about things like feeling that you have to earn it. Yes. Feeling that um, the only after you've earned it, then you get it. Yes. And this is an indication that you actually don't believe, you don't see love as a gift. 
Right. Like when we, ha when we have to earn love, we're not seeing love as a gift. Yeah. So, so somebody can love us no matter what we do. Like God loves people in the hills and they haven't learned, you know, earned anything from God's perspective. Mm. Right? And, and yet God still loves them. They can't feel God's love, of course. Right? And the re one of the main reasons why you can't feel God's love is because you still believe you have to earn it. Yeah. And God's Which going, well, that, that kind of love, I c yeah, that's not the kind of love I'm going to give you. Right, and yeah. that's how it was in my childhood. I felt I had to earn my mother's love. Yes, very much so, particularly your mother's. Particularly my mother's. Yeah. 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 And we go to another man who has the same issue with his mother. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Graham. Um, when I was <laughs> contemplating God, or when I contemplate God, mm -hmm. um, what I've just recently realised is it's what comes up is numb. Yeah. Numbness. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't go one way or the other and that, but it's numbness, you know. And and the interesting thing was that once I realised that, I then, well, okay, well, God's my parent. What do I feel about my parents? And I realised I feel numb about my parents too. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a way that you've used, hasn't it, to, to cope with what has happened. And, and, and what happens is people who are emotionally sensitive uh, generally, and quite emotionally sensitive in their childhood, generally do this. They enter a state of numbness towards uh, things around them. And this is why you have things like asperges and stuff like that come up, because these particular uh, so-called you know, conditions are really the choice of the child to disconnect from the terrible barrages of different kinds of emotions that are confusing coming from the adult world around it. And, uh, but the problem with that, obviously, is we then numb ourselves out with God as well and, and we end up just becoming addicted to using our mind to make choices and decisions. Yeah, so it's, it's a big issue for many people. If we come down to Claudia and across to Jada on this side. I have learned that I really don't want a second mum. <laughs> One mum's enough. Yeah, too much. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. <laughs> Far away, Jenna. I was just going to ask, is there a reason why when we're children and our parents are treating us badly, um, like if God's loving us in those moments, is there a reason that we're not feeling it in those moments as well? We remember that our parents themselves have a disposition, have the emotional disposition. The very first injury on this planet, in fact, was the emotional choice to, re to reject God's love. That's the very first injury. So what you, the persons you hear of as Adam and Eve, Ammon and a man, that, that's the decision they made, to reject God's love. Now, that, as a result of that being the very first decision that was made out of harmony with love, they, that particular problem has been carried down generation to generation throughout humanity. So by the time we have been conceived from that moment onwards, we already have that emotional disposition to not to close, to close out the possibility of God. So this causes us, unfortunately, to then become addicted to parent. Do you understand? I mean physical parents. So when, when you close out God, who is our real parent, so, and this is what many of you are doing, right? You close out God, who is our real parent. This was one of the first decisions ever made. So here, here, is I, here am I. Closing out God, so cutting off my relationship with God. Now I'm going to search for a God substitute, like a parent substitute, which, which means the, very, the parents that I have, the mum and dad that I have, I then look to them to do what God is only able ca or capable of doing. Right? And, and this happens at the time of conception onwards, unfortunately. So, so by the time I'm born and, and start acting and start being able to be physically active, I'm already imposing upon my parents that they have to do what, what you know, because God doesn't exist to me. These parents become my God, really. They become my life. They become, I become completely reliant on them. And this is what I noticed in the first century a lot, is that it was not, not an injury that I actually had in the first century, but I definitely have had it this time, so I understand it, you know, how difficult it is to, to get over it. But in the first century I didn't have it, and, and it's interesting when you don't have it, because you're not expecting your parents to, 
take responsibility for anything uh, for you or any, anything like that. And so it, when I was very, very young in the first century, I was already cooking for myself, cleaning up after myself, taking responsibility for my life. Like, I was basically very similar to this life in, the, in, the, in re that regard, and I was a sort of like the invisible child because there was no hardship caring for me. Does that make sense? Because I was already caring for myself. But, but that was because... Um, in the first century, I had a relationship with God, and that relationship was oh, like I didn't see my parents as God. I didn't see my parents as knowing everything. I didn't see my parents as needing to give me everything that they had. So I, w I didn't. I wasn't reliant on family. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is it worth feeling, ang like feeling angry? Because I feel frustrated about that part of the system, <coughs> where someone can make a choice that far back, and it affects everybody. Honestly, Jada, though, you're making choices today and it affects everyone around you. So how can you then blame other people for doing the same? Like, this is what we need to learn about our will, that it does affect other people. It yeah. does. Yeah. And see, most of us are very insular with that, with the use of our will. We think, we think that my choices don't really affect anybody. And as long as I'm not hurting anybody is what we say to ourselves. And we have no idea what hurt actually means at this point. But we say to ourselves, as long as I'm not hurting anyone physically, um, then I should be able to do what I want. And God's going, no, hang on a sec, no, you don't realise every choice and decision you make that's out of harmony with love, even if it's out of harmony with love of self, actually does harm another person. And this is something we need to understand about our will. Our will has an impact on our environment, not just ourselves. And, and I feel that if, rather than getting angry about that, mm. we need to feel the truth of that, mm -hmm. you see? And, and, and when we get angry about that, we're basically refusing to see the truth about how the effect of our will upon others. Do you follow? Yeah. Yeah. So it's so very important to allow yourself to feel that this is how you feel, so without judgment. Mm -hmm. So allow yourself to feel that's how you feel, but... but but start seeing that it's very important that this particular attitude change because actually how you use your will has a deep impact upon other people just like how other people have used their will has had a deep impact on you yeah yeah so let, let yourself feel that where were we over here uh if we go pamela actually um from a very young age i learned that god is love and god's our father and because I didn't have a father, I substituted God. Now I'm realising that it was sort of codependent. And I really freaked out when you said God doesn't have a relationship with a facade. <laughs> I felt I was cut adrift. I felt my yeah. whole life was a lie. And what yeah. can I do about it? Yeah. Um, but now I'm realising that um, I skipped over being angry because you don't, you're not allowed to be angry, especially yeah. with God. You can't be angry with God. Exactly. But I realised I was really <laughs> angry with God uh, because he, he didn't treat me like a father. My life was hard. And yep. you he didn't know, treat you like you expected, expected a father a to father treat you. To yeah. treat me, yes. And you could say that again comes from the world's definition of what a father should exactly, do. Exactly, yes. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Well, we've only got a few minutes left so uh, in this presentation this morning. So um, I, I want to just briefly touch on the personal methods you use to remain unloving. What did, you, what did you discover in that homework, the personal methods you use? What are some of the methods that you've been using, did you find? Thanks. If we go to Jenny and Scott. Um. My principal method is to get angry, is to totally avoid. It's, it's now an automatic response and I've, um, since you pointed it out to me yep. uh, directly, I've been watching it, uh, you know, moment by moment and yep. it's an automatic response. Yeah. Anger gives us a lot of things that, this is why we go for it, it, it gives us a lot of things. Most people around us will back off if we get angry because most people are afraid of anger so so most people will back off and and so it's a method of controlling the people external to yourself in order to avoid a whole heap of emotions internal to yourself and i realized that this is an interplay between of power between powerlessness and power yep and that when i automatically get angry i'm what you just said i'm 
tr- controlling just everything, all of the circumstances. Um, it's a, it's a kind of a split second. I'm I'm into an anger and. But I've been able to break it down and feel that how deeply I feel powerless, and and um, it's the whole victim thing. Yeah, it is the victim thing that you're angry about. Yep. Who are you, Scott? Yeah, I'll um I'll avoid it by putting something else in front of it. Like I'll just and then if especially if it's confrontation, I'll walk away. Yeah. And then I'll let yep. it build up and I'll get that angry that I'll go and do something un- unloving, like I'll go and chop down a tree with a block splitter because yep. it takes longer. Yeah. And then but then I'll put a time limit on it. Yeah. Like I felt that <laughs> right eh? Yeah. And you know, even if I have a cry about it, yeah. No, no, it's fifteen minutes or that's you know, or something else will happen, like, yep. you know. Or it'll be an animal that'll be hurt, even though I've chopped down a tree, but yeah. I'll go and, you know, try and rescue something. Yeah. You know, yeah. So you create a whole heap of events, just busying yourself up, really. Yeah, yeah. To, don't don't to say, avoid. yeah, right, I've got to go to town, I've got to go do this, or, you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Very common. If we go back to Maxine up the back, across to Michaela up the back. Yep. Maxine first. Um, I have an expectation to be rescued either by a man or God. Yeah. Um, and I feel that I'm not willing to take personal responsibility. I feel tired, lazy. Why bother? Yeah. Um, excuses, excuses. Yeah. Yeah. Which is very common, isn't it, Michaela? Um, I like self punishment and guilt. Yes, uh, that's a go-to for many, isn't it? Yeah. Self punishment, self attack, guilt. Yeah. Or, or ways to avoid potential rage of other people, in fact. Yep. All, all ways to avoid. If we come down in front of Dennis, cross to Ivana on this side, thanks. And then we'll have to call it the uh, day. So, Dennis? Um, I realised that I just run away from the truth of whatever's there. Yeah. I just, so I'm just shit scared. Eh? Yeah. So, you use a lot of what I would call substitution techniques uh, intellectually. Oh, yeah, I'm cool, really. Everything's yeah, fine. Right. Everything's this is how it goes. Yeah. 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 Does it not really happen then? <laughs> not really, yeah. <laughs> no, it's not that bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it's a great way of avoiding feeling the underlying emotional feelings that are there. Yeah. Ivana? Um, I blame everyone else for how I feel yeah. and pretty much don't take responsibility for anything. Yes. It's a primary thing for yourself, isn't it? So it's good that you're seeing some of these things. We need to finish on this homework now, though. But uh, it's good that you guys are seeing some of these things. You can see that it's not hard to find the emotions that you feel as long as you don't judge them. (laughs) If you judge them, you're going to find it very, very difficult to even know what they are. But, But... I must emphasise to each of you, and this is something we will be trying to work a bit on today and tomorrow, that unless the emotion itself is processed, then no change can really occur anyway. So the key gets down to, in a a lot of regards, gets down to choosing to feel the emotion. And this is why tomorrow morning we're going to focus your attention on you know your fear of emotion and 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 what you believe about emotions because it's feeling emotion that's going to help you progress and release a lot of these false beliefs from 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 your own life yeah good oh well let's have a 10 minute break now and then we'll come back and get started in our program today <laughs>